So now we'll have just a little unpacking of Manjushri. So we'll just uh, revive our motivation very briefly. Sange cha dan so ki cha nam la jan chu pa du dan e kap su chi da ki cha nyan ki pe so nam ki dro la pen chu sange ju pa sho sange cha dan so ki cha nam la jan chu pa du dan e kap su chi da ki cha nyan ki pe so nam ki dro la pen chu sange ju pa sho sange cha Jodam so ki chu nam la, jan chu pa du da ne kap su chi, da ki chu nyan ki pe so nam ki, ro la pen chi sang ge ju pa shu. Okay. So later today, I'm going to do the mantra and the iconography. Today, uh, this session, I'm going to do more just the text itself, but um, just to kind of do a couple iconography points, just to kind of get you started, knowing that we'll go into more depth later. Um, just the basics, which I think most of you know, it's important to remember that all deities sit or stand on a lotus, sun, and moon disc. And the reason for this is it represents ren renunciation, correct view, and the mind of enlightenment. So these three principal aspects of the path are essential in every single Tantra that you will ever come across. So never ever forget that the foundation of Tantra is these three principal aspects of the path. So the Lotus, renunciation. There's um, a sliver of a sun disc that sometimes the artist depicts and sometimes they don't, but you know that it's there. And that represents the correct view of emptiness. And then the moon disc re represents the mind of enlightenment bodhicitta. So three principal aspects, three principal aspects cannot be said enough. That's the foundation. And that's um, pervasively true throughout all Buddhist iconography. Now there's also lotuses up here and flowers up here, and those will have a variety of meanings, usually related to wisdom. So we'll talk about those more later. But the other piece of Manjushri, which is maybe the most prominent feature is the flaming sword of wisdom made of sky metal. And the flaming sword of wisdom made of sky metal is to cut through confusion, to cut through ignorance. So it's not uh, encouraging any acts of violence whatsoever, which is probably obvious, but just so we're clear right from the very beginning. Okay, so Manjushri in human form is Lama Tsongkhapa. Of course, Manjushri-ness or the essence of Manjushri can be found in every single Buddha and every single accomplished Lama. But um, in terms of kind of where we tune into as Gelugpa practitioners or as Tibetan Buddhist practitioners, we really think of Lama Tsongkhapa who um, lived in the 14th century and who is the founder of our tradition as kind of the human embodiment of Manjushri. Sometimes they say he's most particularly white Manjushri, but all Manjushris. Okay, so Lama Tsongkhapa was a brilliant scholar practitioner. And what's very cool about Lama Tsongkhapa is that he wasn't necessarily a Buddha when he started out this life. Yeah, when he started out his life, he was a monk. He was an amazing monk. He was a great scholar, but he kind of got to the threshold of what was offered in his area. And he didn't just become complacent and say, I guess that's what we know. He, you know, he said, all right, well, maybe other people have found all of the pieces of Buddhism, because I think here where I am, there are portions that are incomplete, or there's pieces that don't feel consistent, or they feel distorted. And he was not satisfied to just let that be. So he went all over and he gathered all over to get the Dharma back together so that the degeneration of the Dharma wouldn't continue. And it's only natural that a set of teachings would gradually become kind of diffuse and watered down and spread out. And if we allow that, there can be great danger. So we need people like Lama Tsongkhapa who say, oi, stop, 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 stop. We're missing pieces and patch it back together and get all the teachings back together. And also then to practice that in such a deep way that he could realize experientially what the teachings taught and show others how to practice them. 
And of course, Lama Tsongkhapa was most famous for writing the Lam, Lam Rim Chenmo, the great treatise on the stages of the path to enlightenment, which is kind of our Galukpa equivalent of like the Bible. And the reason for that is that the teachings of the Buddha, which I don't know if you can see the teachings of the Buddha, see that bookshelf? <laughs> it's a lot, right? That's a lot, um, 108 volumes. The Buddha was alive for 40 years after his enlightenment, and he taught everywhere to all sorts of people, different audiences, different topics. And to try and like read his teachings in order is not a linear presentation of the teachings. He was teaching to who was in front of him. And so you take someone like Lama Tsongkhapa, who is a scholar of all the Buddha's teachings, and he can say, this is the sections for beginners, this is for intermediate, this is for advanced. And of course, he was relating those teachings based on the outline provided by Lama Atisha, who wrote Lamp to the Path, which was our first Lam Rim text. So these three volumes of the Lam Rim Chenmo, three volumes in English, this is basically everything you need to get to enlightenment, except Tantra. Yeah, it takes you all the way, and then not Tantra. And then Tantra needs to be added to that. So do we need Tantra or not is always the question. Do you need Tantra to be a happy person? No. Do you need Tantra in order to cut the root of samsara? No. Do you need Tantra in order to benefit sentient beings? Hmm, maybe. Not in a regular way, not in an ordinary way. You can just be a nice person, right? Or a bodhisattva is incredibly beneficial to sentient things. But the reason for Tantra is bodhicitta. Yeah, your reason for Tantra is, you know, suffering sentient beings exist right now who you cannot help. And so you want speed in your practice, not for your own sake alone, but because they need you now and you can't help them now. And this quick path to enlightenment implies a lot of investment and it implies a lot of depth. And it means that this is your life now. So if it feels like Tantra can't quite be your whole life now, you can touch it by experimenting with some of these Kriya Tantra practices before you have an empowerment and just kind of see how they live in your life. But to practice them fully implies an empowerment needs to be taken, a relationship with a teacher needs to be made, and you're going to need some vows. Refuge, absolute bare minimum. And then on top of that, absolutely Bodhisattva vows. And the Bodhisattva vows are incredible. They're beautiful. If you're going into higher tantras, um, then you're going to need tantric vows as well. And tantric vows are so kind of nuanced that it's not a good idea to study tantric vows before you have them. You really need to hear them from a lama, and in a way you're not permitted to study them until you have a higher tantric empowerment. The bodhisattva vows, however, you can definitely study before you have them. Okay, so if you don't have bodhisattva vows yet, you're completely allowed to look them up, read all about them. Most of them make sense immediately upon reading, and it's just a matter of, do I think I can try and do this? And remembering that in Buddhism, to keep a vow purely means that you don't break a root vow, and it means whenever you transgress, you confess and purify and do some sort of restoration practice, and you're good to go. So it doesn't mean being perfect. It doesn't mean being perfect. You wouldn't need vows if you were perfect. The reason for vows is that you're not perfect, but you can be and you will be, and these are supportive processes to lead you there. And refuge, of course, is a foundation. And so this is where we kind of have a split in Buddhism that's for everyone and Buddhism that's for Buddhists. Yeah. So, you know, basically the whole Lam Rim Chenmo, if you're not Buddhist, you can take what you like. If you like bits of this and bits of that, you're very welcome to any of the tools and strategies and logics in the whole sutra path. You're allowed to practice any of them. But once you get into Tantra, even lower Tantra, that is the realm of actual card carrying Buddhists. Those are closed practices for Buddhists only. So, you know, it might be that you, you know, tiptoed into some, you know, Kriya Tantra practices and pujas before you were actually Buddhist. It's not like the end of the world. No one's going to strike you down, right? But just to know that, 
that's where the split occurs. Yeah, Buddhism that's for everyone and Buddhism that's for Buddhists is a, basically a sutra for everyone, tantra just for Buddhists. Yeah, because it rests on that foundation of refuge in Buddha Dharma Sangha as your primary source of refuge and the goals therein. So the only reason to practice Tantra is because you want to become enlightened. Yeah, some people think they wanna practice Tantra because they want a cool form of meditation with lots of visualization and smells and bells and fancy stuff, or they wanna start working with their subtle energy system and they wanna start playing with their chakras and it's exotic and tantalizing. And those are not the reasons to practice Tantra. And in fact, it's quite dangerous to do so because you start messing with systems that you don't understand without a refuge, without a teacher, you can get really tangled. And the most common thing that happens is basically it doesn't work. And then you think Tantra doesn't work. But in fact, it only works if you have all the conditions together and you're doing it properly. So, you know, it's, it's an interesting thing to sit with of how we have kind of a intellectual arrogance because we kind of sort of intellectually get the ideas about transformation and about energies. We think we can just dive right in without any refuge, without any renunciation, without any bodhicitta, without any understanding of emptiness. We give it a go and then it kind of doesn't work and we assume that means it doesn't work. Or we think there's something wrong with us. And neither of those are true. It's just the foundation hasn't been established. So we need the foundation and we need to be Buddhist to practice Tantra. So, so if you're lurking, I think all of you are Buddhist, but if you're, if you're a lurker, um, you can lurk a little bit, but just know it's not really for you if you're not Buddhist, because this is for Buddhahood. Okay. Yeah. All right, so we're going to dig into the sadhana now, and sadhana, again, just means practice manual. And so starting at the top, this is um, the practice to receive the seven types of wisdom. And this particular sadhana was composed by the fifth Dalai Lama. We're up to the 14th Dalai Lama, as you all know. So the fifth Dalai Lama composed this. And um, as it says here, this practice requires a Jainong, which is a permission empowerment of orange Manjushri received on the basis of a great initiation in the class of Kriya Tantra Kriya means action or higher in order to be able to do the self-generation into the deity. The self-generation means seeing yourself as the deity. That's what self-generation means. The deity refers to Manjushri. If one doesn't have such an empowerment, one may still do the practice. However, generate Manjushri at the crown of the head at the time of the self-generation. So instead of seeing yourself as Manjushri, you see Manjushri at the crown of your head, facing the same direction as you and just adjust all of the instructions to go to that area there. Some people prefer to see him in the space in front facing them and that's acceptable as well. Okay, so before we um, jump into the practice, did you wanna ask anything about empowerments or self-generation? or you know, empowered, non-empowered, the two ways to practice. Did you wanna clarify anything there? Yeah, Eve, go ahead. Okay, so um, this has been an area of confusion every once in a while, because when I sign up for a class, it might say all are welcome and it might say none are welcome. So mm -hmm. I'm looking for a little bit more personal advice. I understand not absorbing the deity in my case would be appropriate. Um, and I'm here because you're the teacher and I'm very curious. I'm kind of new to Buddhism, but I feel very Buddhist. Um, what would be a more personal advice to somebody who's in my position? Should I look in on the class uh, and absorb what I can, you know, at my level or just pass? What do you think? Look, if you feel an affinity if you feel a, like a genuine curiosity to just kind of like, I don't know if I'm ready for Tantra yet, but I kind of want to see what they get up to. If you keep a really open mind, you're very welcome to come. Just know that some of it is going to feel, I guess, a little elaborate or a little heady unless you have context. Um, because a lot of the images and a lot of the visualizations imply a background understanding of some of the concepts. 
So I'm going to say things like lack of inherent existence, and you may or may not feel familiar with those concepts, and it might be a little bit bewildering. So if you feel like confusion is not enough to put you off, stick around. <laughs> If you feel like, um, you know, when we get into all this elaboration that you don't have context for, you're starting to get a bit overwhelmed or it's a bit boring because you just don't get the background, totally feel free to, to leave at any time and I won't be offended at all. But stay if you're curious, go if you're overwhelmed. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you for that answer. No worries. No worries. Okay. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Uh, Venerable, I just may i just ask it's pamela um i wanted to ask about the distinction you made that tantra is for buddha um and then you said based on um refuge in the buddha the dharma and the sangha so i'm a little bit confused about how refuge is refuge vows are distinguished from tantric vows in this case um being buddhist or not in the way that you were describing well, to be Buddhist means that your primary source of refuge is Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. That makes you a Buddhist. Okay. You can be um, an adherent of Buddhist ten tenets if you um, accept the four seals, which is, you know, all compounded phenomena are impermanence and all blah, blah, that one. Yes. <clears throat> um, so that's an adherent of Buddhist tenets. You don't have to be Buddhist. You can just kind of be a philosopher of Buddhism. But to be an actual Buddhist, you need to think the three jewels, Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha, are your heart refuge, your primary refuge. Now, on that basis, because you want to be enlightened, because you want to cut the root of suffering and ignorance, you think, also, I bet everyone else would like to be out of this mess. And so you generate bodhicitta on top of refuge. And the bodhicitta that you generate is still aspirational. You know, it hasn't become a main mind. It hasn't completely taken over your consciousness, and, but it's something you believe and you love. And to support that bodhicitta, you might take bodh bodhisattva vows. Just like if you're having refuge, you might then take refuge vows, like not to kill, not to steal, not to lie, etc., to support your refuge. So it's like you can have refuge without refuge lay vows, you can have bodhicitta without bodhisattva vows, but those vows support the practice of those things. For Tantra, you need to have the structure of vows for the merit and for the ethics. Yeah, for both the merit and the ethics, because it takes a great deal of merit to practice Tantra without getting confused, without getting distorted, without kind of getting lost in the fun of it. Um, you need a very steady mind, a very ethical steady mind, and you need very strong bodhicitta. So that's why you need the container of extra vows to practice Tantra, is because it's harder. It requires more, you know, battery power, karmic battery power. So um, once you have bodhisattva vows, then you might think, actually, I'm ready for practices that are even more intense in the Tantric path. And I'm going to go ahead and do higher yoga tantra practices and take tantric vows. The thing to know about tantric vows is that they're related to the five Buddha families and that they imply daily practice. Before you have highest yoga tantra, your daily practice is up to you. Yeah. Or if you have a Kriya Tantra practice, it might be just a little mantra commitment, or it might be just you have Bodhisattva vows, but you don't look at them very often. It's really a lot more flexible about what your life looks like. Once you have highest yoga Tantra, you have a lifetime commitment for specific practices that you've promised to do forever. So it's just a level of commitment. It's a level, a level of investment that gradually builds up into higher and higher. So it's personal, um, whether you feel up for it, ready for it or not. Um, but non-Buddhists don't have to worry about that whole story. <laughs> Just stay out of trouble. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. So um, some people have a few miscellaneous Kriya Tantra, which is lower Tantra empowerments like Tara, like Medicine Buddha. And if you have these lower Tantric empowerments, it doesn't mean you have all of them. Okay, so if you have green Tara, that does not mean you have white Tara. If you have, um, you know, white Manjushri, it doesn't mean you have orange Manjushri. 
some teachers will be a little bit more flexible, but just because you have one or two doesn't mean you get to see yourself as the deity, even though you have an empowerment. Unless you have this specific empowerment, you still need to visualize the deity at the crown or in the space in front, okay? Because you don't yet have permission to practice or the connection of the lineage and the blessings of the guru specific to this formula. Okay, so if you have been, that's fine, just stop, okay? <laughs> yeah, and um, some people have gone to a Manjushri Jainong, like a blessing, you know, it's a permission to practice, but you've taken it as a blessing, but you have no other tantric empowerments. To technically take it, you need to have taken what's called a great initiation first. And a great initiation is usually great medicine Buddha or great Chenrezig are the most common in our tradition and they last two days. So if you haven't had an empowerment that's gone over two days, <laughs> you probably haven't technically taken um, a proper Jainong because they're kind of add-ons. Okay, so this is all kind of like technical empowerment stuff, but it's important to know if you really want to dig into this. So if you've taken like great Chen Rezig and then another Lama gives you a Manjushri Jainong, you have full permission to practice this in its fully fledged form. If you've taken the Jainong without having taken a great empowerment first, you've got the blessing and the connection, but you haven't yet got full permission to practice in the self-generation way. Are you with me or did I lose anybody? Can I just ask, so I, I, you almost lost me, <laughs> but uh, I, I'm trying to stay, uh, stay uh, in, in understanding. Uh, so I had no idea it was this complicated. Is there some, some you know, amazing American style, like I, I'm just gonna do this thing and I'll get it all? <laughs> um, no. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I mean, there's the there's the Rinchen Gatso empowerment, which Lama Zopa Rinpoche started a few years ago in Australia and didn't finish, which is pretty much all of the main deities, but it lasts days and days and days. So you could, you know, get the whole lot if a Lama is giving the whole lot, but it's going to be days and days of empowerments and you've got to, you know, brace yourself, take lots of vitamin C, you know, it's, it's a thing. Um, <laughs> so there is that. So if you if you ever hear the Rinchen Gatso um, empowerment is coming up and you have time off, you can get the whole lot. Um, if there's one that you've wanted to practice and it never seems to come up at your Dharma centers, just request your Lama, you know, like have a kata, have an offering, go to, you know, like make an appointment and say, please, 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 can you give green Tara or whatever it is, or some, you know, kind of obscure one that you feel a strong connection to just ask because it creates the cause for it to happen. And then often other students will really benefit as well. Like here at Land of Medicine Buddha, we're gonna have Kunrig empowerment um, from Jado Rinpoche. And it's really rare. It's like a really obscure deity that not many people practice. And it's because of the merit and the requests of the students and Jado Rinpoche's kindness that we get to do that. But um, these things don't happen out of nowhere. So also be like proactive. Yeah, if you're feeling, yes, I love Manjushri, I've learned about it enough, I wanna do it a lot. Just ask your teacher, please, can we do Manjushri? Please. They usually say yes. Yes, Teresa. I'm doing my first empowerment on Zoom in a few weeks. I've never done that. It seems a little strange to me. Can you get an empowerment over Zoom? Can you give get an empowerment over Zoom? 100% you can. Um, what you do is in empowerments, there's a lot of stuff that goes around to the group. Most of what goes around that you take during an empowerment ceremony is in the form of water or saffron water, which has been blessed to be something or something and all of that will be clarified in the empowerment or you can ask questions afterwards. So that's where people generate doubt is they think, how can I do this online if I can't take all the empowerment substances? Mm -hmm. And, you know, things will come around and like be bonked on your head and you'll have to like use something and hold something and there's stuff, right? There's accoutrement. So <laughs> when this happens, you just think, I am receiving this now. Mm -hmm. And you just really firmly visualize, 
I am receiving this now. When you see the Lama hand it to his attendant to go around to the in-person group, mm -hmm. you think it's happening to you. Mm -hmm. And um, people like His Holiness the Dalai Lama give empowerments online live, um, not super regularly, but maybe every six months or so. So if there's empowerments you've been hanging out for and you don't have a local Dharma center with a resident teacher that's of that caliber, His Holiness is there. He even gives highest yoga tantra. He gave Yamantaka, I think, last year. Mm. So um, you just keep thinking, okay, whatever that is that he's holding, whether I understand it or not, I think I accept. Yeah, and that's the same for when you're reciting Tibetan after your teacher, mm. when he says, repeat after me, and you're like, oh, I'll try. <laughs> yes, and they're like, <laughs> and you're like, <laughs> um, you think whatever you've said, I agree, mm. I accept, I agree, I accept. And you can kind of visualize that like, you know, golden light blessings from the Lama to you are coming and being received and really just feel that connection with the Lama. And if you don't feel a cl connection with the Lama, don't take that empowerment, you know, because the relationship with the Lama is completely intertwined with the empowerment. And that's another piece where we can get a little sidetracked mm. is that there's an empowerment we've always wanted but we don't know the Lama who's giving it, but we're excited about the empowerment. Don't <laughs> rush it, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. um, lots of wonderful Lamas out there, but just because they're wonderful doesn't mean they're right for you karmically. Mm -hmm. And that down the, down the track, you won't find certain personality traits and quirks that disturb your mind and kind of trouble your practice. Mm -hmm. This can happen um, where they're completely fine lamas, but your own obscurations are too strong to really see them as Buddha during your practice. Mm -hmm. So you want to make sure you know them a bit. You know their ways, you know they, the way they teach and the way they speak and the way they interact with their students enough that you can see this figure in an enlightened way during your practice. Mm -hmm. Maybe you see them in an enlightened way while they teach as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what we hope. Mm -hmm. And some people try to see them as enlightened, even when they're walking around having coffee, you know, whatever. Um, and that is, uh, it can work <laughs> and it can be problematic. And there are two schools of thought on that. So in the sutra tradition, we see the Lama or the teacher as the representation of the Buddha or like the mouthpiece of the Buddha for you. Mm -hmm. In the Tantra tradition, we see the Lama as the Buddha while we're doing our deity yoga practice. Mm -hmm. While we're doing our deity yoga practice, then, <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. Then the rest of the time that you see them, you can try practicing that as well. But um, there are some schools of thought that take it very literally, like super literally and think, you know, if the Lama sneezes, that's a teaching for me. If they scratch their eye, that's a teaching for me specifically about eye scratching and something it represents. And you can kind of get into this weird mental gymnastics of over interpreting every single thing. Mm -hmm. And then what happens if they do something that is a little sketchy, mm -hmm. then you do this whole tangle of trying to make it okay. Like what if they yell at a student? It might be perfect for that student. Mm -hmm. It might be they're the sort of student that really responds well to direct fierceness mm -hmm. or the human being might just be angry. And will that disturb your mind to see that? So Tantra is delicate because you're relating to a human being with human aspects, but you have no idea who they actually are. You just know that the deity is there with them. Yeah, the deity is there, but if they are the deity or not, that's actually who knows, yeah? So we always say His Holiness the Dalai Lama is Chen Rezig, the Buddha of compassion, and I believe that very much, but I cannot prove it. We cannot take another person's measure. Yeah, it could be the cat in his house is the Buddha of compassion, and he's just a sweet old man. We have no idea. So Tantra, there's a literalness that you want to bring to your cushion, but you don't want to get weird and fundamentalist off your cushion. Yeah, and that's a delicate line and it can make you a little bit confused. And one of the many reasons not to rush into Tantra, but just hear that the relationship with the guru and the relationship with the deity are very intertwined. So if you don't have a connection with the guru, don't take the empowerment. Does that make sense? Yeah.
slowly, slowly, yes. <laughs> and um, the, the tricky one is when you meet a llama that you think probably will be great and is probably gonna be one of your guys and you're, you know, you're all in and you're up for it, but you don't really know them yet, yeah. what to do. You know, and they've been vetted and they've been, um, people love them and all the higher llamas say, yes, they're great. And you think I can rely on the opinion of my betters. But even in that case, at least take a few moments, pause, a few days, pause, a few months, years, pause to sleep on it and just think, is this right for me? Talk to them in your heads, you know, really talk to them in your practice. Like, is this the right time you and me? Um, because again, they could be perfect, but not perfect for you. And, you know, death is coming and Tantra is rare. So these are really personal choices, but don't let peer pressure dictate your choices about empowerments. And you will, if you ever are in a physical Dharma center, when there's a big Lama coming, giving an empowerment, there will be peer pressure of lots of people saying, oh, such a rare opportunity. Oh, they're so amazing. Rare opportunity. So amazing. Rare opportunity. So amazing. And you're like, all right, culty, cultish, weirdos. Stop it. Settle down. Stop being groupies. Like, chill. Yeah. Like, everybody needs to make their own choices about their path. Yeah. But if people are feeling, you know, I'm not sure, but I love this llama, I'm not sure if I'm ready for Tantra, that's another conversation because we might think we need to be perfect to practice Tantra and we don't need to be. You do need an understanding of renunciation, correct view and bodhicitta and conviction that they are right and true and things that you love and want in your practice. You don't have to have a total realization of them, even though in the traditional texts it says, to take Tantra, you need a realization of renunciation, bodhicitta, and correct view. That's best case scenario. But you do need to understand those three principal aspects of the path and hence conviction in them and want them and have them in your practice. Does that make sense? So, you know, it doesn't have to have completely absorbed into your mind, but you love those three, you believe those three, and then you can take, yeah. Yeah, so there are a lot of layers. And right now today, we're just kind of looking at it because there's the very simple way to practice Tantra, which is just out of emptiness appears this deity who embodies these qualities. Out of emptiness appears Manjushri who embodies wisdom. Now I'm gonna connect with wisdom. Om Marapatsanadi, Om Marapatsanadi. Done, right? Dedicate for enlightenment, done. So, you know, that practice exists and that might be what you do if you have a mantra commitment of one of the deities. Out of emptiness arises Chen Rezig. Chen Rezig embodies compassion and wisdom. Omani Pimium, Omani Pimium, Omani Pimium. I dedicate for enlightenment, done. Fine, totally fine. But if you want to know the more in-depth forms, it's good to kind of understand the layers of it, especially if you're going through a time where you really feel like you could use extra support in that area. Mm -hmm. So these Kriya Tantra practices may or may not be daily practices for you. They're more like options. And it might be that you cycle through them. You know, that one week you're really focusing Manjushri, one week you're really focusing Tara. You're keeping all your commitments, but you're emphasizing just one so as not to overwhelm yourself. Yeah, yeah. Heather, did you want to ask? Yeah, just briefly. So um, when I took the Manjushri Empowerment um, I hadn't done highest yoga, uh, highest yoga tantra empowerment. I I now have. So do I get to retroactively generate? Do you, do you see what I'm saying? Or yeah, that... yeah. So you've had the you had the Jainong, but you'd never had even a great empowerment, like a chen, like a great Chen Rezig or a great Medicine Buddha. Who knows? No, <laughs> no. I, I've done. I've done. I mean, I don't know if I can say, but I've you know I've done. Chakra Sambhava and Vajrayogini yeah. Ayur Griva. But so can I, because I yeah, have- Yeah, yeah, now, yes, retrospectively, I see what you're okay. saying. Okay, retrospectively, yeah. I can- Yeah, and, okay. and some teachers oh. will say, once you have any highest yoga tantra empowerment, you can do any lowest tantra empowerment, whether you have the Jainong or not. Some will say that. Yeah. Um, the more traditional view is you still need to have had the Jainong, but um, if it was before or if it's after your highest yoga, doesn't matter. Cool. Yeah, you're, go you're good to go. You're golden. Yeah. Jump in with both feet. Yes. Um, so Manjushri is also, it's good to know that 
with these four classes of Tantra, there's lower Tantra, there's um, performance Tantra, yoga Tantra, and highest Tantra, these four. In our tradition, we mostly just practice lower and highest, not these middle two. Um, Kunrig that we're about to do is performance Tantra, which is part of why it's rare. We don't usually do any of the middle two. That's an interesting aside. But um, the lower Tantra deities have a relationship with the higher Tantra deities. So in this case, Manjushri is the lower tantric form of Yamantaka, the highest yoga tantra form. So the same, yeah? And if you ever see a picture of Yamantaka, there's a little Manjushri head in amongst his many heads. Not a coincidence. So it's kind of like you have your training wheels version of the practice, and then you have your like grown up version of the practice. And lower Tantra is to clear obstacles and to increase health and long life so that you can practice highest yoga Tantra. Yeah, but you're taking everything you know from the sutra tradition about wisdom and you're plugging in it into your Manjushri practice. It's not like it's a whole different practice. Yeah, they're, they're related. And you take everything that you know about practicing patience and loving kindness in order to antidote anger you're taking that information and then you're using Manjushri or Yamantaka to use the energy of anger, but change the affliction. <laughs> yes, get rid of the affliction and replace it with compassion, loving kindness, etc. So you can't transform an affliction, even though we say that in Tantra loosely and colloquially, you can't change something bad into something good. You can finish the bad and replace it with good. Yes, but you know when you're really angry and then you're no longer intellectually obsessed with your story of anger, but your body is still flushed and you're still a bit shaky? Yeah, you know that power that is happening in your energy system, imagine if you could use that power in your energy system for bodhicitta, for loving kindness, and it was steady instead of agitated. So this is what we're looking at. And you know, when you're around the llamas, they have this big, warm energy around them. And it's, they're able to use their energy system in a controlled way, rather than the out of control way that happens with big afflictions like anger. Yeah. So that's some of the fun Tantra stuff. Okay. <laughs> All right. So back to the practice. So we usually have a homage at the beginning of a sadhana. Namo Guruja Vagiya Saraya, and my pronunciation of Sanskrit is going to be wrong, but close, <laughs> okay? And of course, when you hear the Tibetans say it, it will have a Tibetan accent, just like I have an American accent. You do your best. But it basically means I bow to the guru who is one in nature with Manjushri. Yeah, that's what that Sanskrit line means. And then we have this nice little homage of I pay obeisance to you, great Tsongkhapa. Related to Lama Tsongkhapa that we mentioned earlier, the personification of Manjushri in human form with all the marks and signs of perfection. The marks and signs of perfection real, relate to the Tathagata Garbha, the Buddha nature um, category of the teachings, which describe what all of the features of a Buddha mean. So a fully enlightened Buddha has um, something like 80 marks and all these minor signs. And there's a whole list of why gold or why orange, why long ears, why third eye, all these things, these marks and signs. These are all results of different kinds of practice. It's an interesting thing to explore. You don't need to, but when you see marks and signs, they're talking about um, the features of an enlightened being. So they're saying that Manjushri has all the features of an enlightened being. Your magnificent attainments were nurtured in the matrix of motherly method and wisdom combined. So like all Buddhas, they com he combines method and wisdom. So not uh, one or the other combined unity union. And the vibrant syllable D is the embodiment of that method and wisdom. So D is that um, Tibetan syllable, which is called the seed syllable. Um, for Manjushri, it's D. For Chenrezig, it's Hum. For Tara, it's Tam. All deities have a seed syllable, 
which is kind of like the essence of what they're about. And we'll talk more about the mantra and the syllable later, but the essence of Manjushri is encompassed by this syllable D. And if the Tibetan is too exotic and too off-putting, you can visualize it also in English characters or whatever language is your preference. It just needs to represent this sound, the sound D, okay? So D represents method and wisdom combined. Sipping the nectars of the profound teachings directly from Manjushri's masterly eloquence, you realize the heart of wisdom. Inspired by your example, I will now set out a description of the steps for actualization of Manjushri, the Bodhisattva of wisdom, in accord with your realization. So we're talking about, again, this relationship between Manjushri and Lama Tsongkhapa being one in nature. The part that will confuse us is Bodhisattva. Because you think, isn't Manjushri a Buddha? Yes, Buddha, Manjushri is a Buddha. But sometimes when we hear Bodhisattva related to a description of a Buddha, we're talking a little bit about what happens in terms of manifestation during the time of the Buddha. Okay, so you guys know in the, in the Heart Sutra, they describe a conversation. Yeah, in the Heart Sutra, there's a conversation between Shariputra and Avalokiteshvara. And Avalokiteshvara is the Sanskrit word for Chenrezig, the Buddha of compassion. And in the Heart Sutra, they say the Bodhisattva, the Mahasattva, the Arya Avalokiteshvara. And you're like, is he not a Buddha? He is a Buddha, but when he's with Shakyamuni Buddha, he's taking a one down positioning for the sake of the group, for the sake of the experience. So as a Buddha, you can manifest as anything. You can manifest as a bridge or a boat or a bodhisattva, or a dog, or a Buddha again, or a different Buddha, you know, you can manifest as anything. So for the sake of the dialogue and the important thing that was happening in Rajagriya on Vulture's Peak, Chenrezig took the aspect of a bodhisattva when he was with the Buddha to model what a senior student would do, to show the other students, here's what you do, you ask questions. You say, I have this experience, is this the perfection of wisdom? And then, you know, so Shariputra was inspired and asked these questions of Avalokiteshvara, the senior student, and they have this dialogue in front of the Buddha who was showing the aspect of being a Buddha. But the whole Heart Sutra is pretty much just Shariputra and Avalokiteshvara talking. And at the end, the Buddha says, well said. Yes, well said, well said. And this, this kind of modeling you see all throughout the sutras, which is really showing us how to learn and how to study. We have to ask questions. We have to test our, our experiences, actual realizations or leading up to realizations. And that also the Buddha doesn't have the copyright on enlightenment. He's not the only one that became enlightened. So he's not needing to posture and say, I'm the only one that knows all the things. He's saying, let, let I have Lokiteshvara explain it this time. He knows the things. You can know the things, all the things. They can be known, not just by me. And it's a very empowering way to approach a religion, isn't it? Yeah, that this knowledge can be shared and this knowledge can be actualized by anyone. So in this context, um, we're kind of looking at Manjushri as the bodhisattva aspect knowing that he's actually a Buddha. Okay, so you don't actually have to read this part every time you do the sadhana if you don't want to. This is kind of the author's launch sequence. Yes, the author. Um, to, if you want to start at the start start, you can just start with, bodhicitta, with refuge in bodhicitta. Okay, so this is, it's nice to know what this little launch sequence is about, but if it's not your vibe, you can just shift and start right with refuge in bodhicitta. And these are your familiar friends, right? Refuge in bodhicitta come up every single practice as well they should. You're reconnecting with your outer and inner refuge. You're reconnecting with your reason for doing the whole practice. And then you're reinforcing it with the four immeasurable thoughts. And this shouldn't be seen as preliminaries to race over in order to get to the heart of the practice. These need to be seen as the essentials to hold and carry and imbue the rest of the practice. So whether you pause here and meditate or not, 
make sure you touch it somehow with your mind with genuineness, even if it's only for a second. And with the four immeasurables, um, there are a lot of ways to approach the four immeasurables. You can do one by one brief meditation, you know, brief meditation love, brief meditation compassion, brief meditation joy, brief meditation equanimity. Or you can just kind of touch base with them quickly. Or you can do what we did last session, which is touch base with them quickly and go into a Tonglen meditation. So if you're wondering where to do your Tonglen meditations once you start practicing Tantra as your main practice, Tonglen goes with the four immeasurables. Yeah. Any, any questions about those two sections? Those are your most familiar sections, I'm guessing, but please ask if you have any questions. Anything about refuge and bodhicitta prayers or about four immeasurable thoughts? How to do it just in your own practice? For you guys who have been practicing a long time for refuge in bodhicitta, you can visualize the merit field during this time. Um, and you can visualize that first white light comes and purifies, second gold light comes and brings blessings and realization. Um, if the full merit field you like, but you cannot visualize, you can think many into one and just Shakyamuni Buddha is the representative of everybody. Or in this case, you could think Lama Tsongkhapa if you prefer. Yeah, so refuge would have that visualization if you want to, no pressure, gently, gently. Most important is to connect with refuge. And Tonglen, I think all of you guys know about Tonglen, but did you want to clarify anything about it? or any bits where you get stuck when doing giving and taking meditation? Yeah, Eleanor, go ahead. Unmute. Sorry, didn't unmute. That's all right. Um, I, I was just wondering when doing Tong Men, for how long do you, does one do it? Is if you're a, doing, a, yeah, if you're doing it on its own, you know, you do it for 10, 20 minutes. If you're doing yeah. it in the sadhana, like, yes. three, minutes, like three minutes. Okay. Yeah. yeah. You know, unless you're on a roll and you really want to give it tons of space and time. But mm. like all Tonglen meditation, start with yourself and your own stuff. Yeah. Start with, I am taking on my grumpy, stressed mind. I am taking on my sick, rebellious body. And I'm giving that to where it came from, the self-cherishing thought destroying it and now i'm giving out all of my you know happy resources my beautiful new zealand hobbit home all of the things i'm sending out to all sentient beings yes and um giving 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 and then you know friends and family people in general the whole world all the sentient beings yep in out in out and just at the end it's helpful to kind of think now all of this roots of virtue and merit and happiness that i sent out collects back, dissolves into my heart, but now it's been like filtered, no longer carrying self-cherishing with it, no longer carrying the heaviness of my attachment and craving. So it's not like you're bereft of all your merits and virtues. It's just now they're not so tainted with your self-interest. Yeah, so it can be quite a quick process. And you know, if some days you're really wanting to focus on the mantra section, you don't need to do Tonglen there. It's just, were you to want to, that's where it would go. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah. Also, for um, beginning re taking refuge, is it also appropriate to do, you know, like the father on one side, the mother on one side, you know, to do that to yeah. set that whole image up, you know, um, as a preliminary or as yeah. a yeah. Mm. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a beautiful way. That's um, Eleanor's describing what is um, kind of literally spelled out in the Vajrasattva Sadhana, but it's actually a very common way to approach practice, which is to think, I am doing this for everyone I have a karmic connection with. And in fact, you have a karmic connection with everyone, but you're starting with the people of this life that you have very strong karmic connection with, whether good or bad, and that you're doing this on their behalf. Because in some ways, the only reason you can do it is because of all of the influences and conditions related to others anyway. 
so you're kind of taking all of these connections and thinking, may we share in the merit of this practice, just as I've benefited from my interactions with you. So the way it goes is female presenting relatives on the left side, male presenting relatives on the right side, whether you like them or not, whether they're blood or not, just whoever you put in those categories, you know, we all have different families. And then people you do not like in the front facing you, people you love very much but are not related to in the back. Yeah, four quadrants. And then around them are strangers on the outer ring. And that kind of radiates out infinitely, including all sentient beings, including animals, etc. So you can just, you can think that gently and slowly, like literally here is mom, literally here is dad, all sisters, all aunties, all grandmas, all daughters, literally all, you know, grandpas, uncles, nephews, whatever one by one think of their faces and really thinking that you're doing this practice all together because it really does help your loving kindness or you can just think that's the case and jump right in yeah either way is okay but if you have a connection with that practice eleanor that's a really lovely one to reinforce so by all means give it lots of air time because it's a beautiful thing to bring in yeah okay. so so again keep hearing there's the simple way and the elaborate way of everything in buddhism and if you get overwhelmed, don't feel like you're doing it wrong if you do the simple way. The simple way is not wrong, it's just the simple way. Yeah, no problem. And when you get into Tantra, there's always the short manual and the long manual, or the short sadhana and the long sadhana. And the short sadhana is to remind you of the long sadhana, but it might be that you have no idea what the long sadhana says yet. That's okay. That's okay, you'll work into it. So um, just kind of manage the feeling of overwhelm because that is the easiest thing to happen in Buddhism is that there's so many things you could do that you get overwhelmed and can't do anything. <laughs> yeah. And that actually walking the dog saying Omarapatsana D is useful. Yes. <laughs> just walking the dog Omarapatsana D, Omarapatsana D, Omarapatsana D. Slowly, you don't have to do yinted speed. Omarapatsana D, Omarapatsana You know, just slowly. Yeah, or you can just think orange light radiating from my crown. May everybody have wisdom. Stop being so weird, everyone. Stop being so clouded. Stop reading weird news articles. Stop <laughs> scrolling. Wisdom, wisdom, wisdom. You know, keep it really simple. It's totally fine and still actually of great benefit. You know, good practice is intentional practice. Yeah, bad practice is just when it's half hearted or the distractions have been indulged. That's bad practice. Yeah, poor motivation, half-hearted, indulging distractions. So if it's simple, that doesn't mean it's wrong. But I think the, the piece here that I, I wanna offer to us is that when you get bored in your practice or when you get bored in your meditation, that can be seen as a sign that your mind has space to weave in more elaboration and more depth. So it's like, keep it totally simple until your mind has enough space for more. And then gently weave in another layer and another layer. Because what you're wanting in all practices is to be in the zone, you know, to be completely absorbed in the practice. And for us, especially as modern people who are so stimulated, Tantra works really well because we can be stimulated in a virtuous way by a lot of different um, senses being addressed. You know, you have your tactile object, you have a verbal thing, you have something visualized, you have an analytical process. And if all of that feels like too much, you can just, orange is nice. <laughs> yes, all of that, you know? So it just depends day by day. Some days you've got all this space for elaboration and you want to just do the mantra, but then you're thinking of plans for work and you're thinking about family stuff and you just cannot get yourself to focus. Well, then just weave in more elaboration into the, into the visualization because that will kind of help absorb you in this wisdom practice. Does that make sense? Yeah. So gently, gently. Yeah, Heather, go ahead. You know, I, I think I actually have maybe an opposite problem that that I can visualize lots of stuff and feel like I'm in it and 
But if I try to just simplify to concentrating on mm -hmm. anything, I fall apart. I it, I don't know if that makes sense. It, it, yeah. It's easy for me to get in the movie, for lack of a better way to describe it. Absolutely. I, I don't think that that means that my mind is stable. Yeah, yeah. And it's a good point because we can have completely opposite obstacles for the same reason. And the reason is attachment. <laughs> right. Um, and there's minds that just like are hungry for pictures and sounds and smells and on just hungry attached mind. And there are minds that freak out with elaboration and just need things to be quiet and simple. And what, what happens in a Tantra Sadhana, once you're really used to it, is that it goes from elaborate to simple, from elaborate to simple, from elaborate to simple. And what that does is it makes your mind really flexible. And it makes then when you are off the cushion, you can zoom in and be with the person in front of you and then zoom out to what does the day need to look like? What does the year need to look like? What does the organization need to look like? What's the big picture of things? And then you can zoom back into, okay, in this moment, I just need to chop some carrots and not chop my thumb off, you know? And it just makes you really have this amazing flexibility of mind that can zoom in and out. And that, you know, that's just repetition with the practice. So there'll be, there'll be a point at which your mind has a grump when you're doing the sadhana. And, you know, we're going to do this a few times and different, different sessions, you're going to like different parts and different sessions, you're going to have kind of like an annoyed, resistant, could this go faster? Could this go slower feeling? And it's going to change day by day, session by session, but it's just, it's just what your mind gets up to. And it's helpful to do the same practice again and again, because you realize the part that was annoying one session is not annoying now, and now another part's annoying. And it's just your mind is trying to settle. It's just trying to settle and release expectations and release attachments. And for a long time with my sadhanas, I just did what it said. Yeah, I didn't even read commentaries. I didn't even go to classes about it. I just, all right, this sentence says to do this. I'll just try that. Then the next sentence, okay, I'll do that. And then the next sentence, okay, I'll do that. <laughs> yeah, and you actually learn a great deal by just slowing it down in that way, sentence by sentence. So when you're doing this by yourself, really do it at a gentle speed. Sometimes when you're doing group practice, it goes at quite a quick clip. You know, and people are just and they just read through it. And it's kind of like they're just increasing imprints and touching base. But how much they're actually practicing, only the really familiar practitioners are able to visualize at that speed. The rest of the group is just trying to follow along and get their mouth around the words and is slightly aggravated at the translators for some of their word choices, right? <laughs> it's like if I have to say unfathomable, unfathomable more times oh i tell you what like in the tara puja it's like four times in one paragraph really translators really you know so like that happens too right so just gently gently <laughs> yeah. okay so these guys are our old friends we know these guys then we have the swaboa Baba mantra, Baba mantra note, but this one is talking about how yourself and all phenomena and the deity have a basic purity. They have a basic purity, which is that they are empty of inherent existence. So purifying perception in emptiness, this has a lot of layers. And this is this one mantra could be investigated for days, months, years. It's a beautiful mantra, but what you can think of it's doing in the sadhana itself is just clearing all of your superstitions before you start visualizing. So before you start visualizing, just imagine that this mantra does a clean sweep of all of your tightness, all of your fundamentalism, all of your kind of doubts and superstitions, and that there's just this spacious, vivid clarity from which the rest of the practice can arise. Yeah, spacious, vivid clarity from which the rest of the practice can arise. So whether you sit with this for a minute or you sit with it for 10 minutes or you just sit with it for a few seconds, 
make sure you're connecting with everything is empty of inherent existence because it dependently arises. I'm going to understand that in layers and layers over time, but let's not grasp onto inherently existent Manjushri. Yeah. And then you visualize. So at this point, everything that's come before imbues, but you don't have to be thinking of it in words. You don't have to be thinking of it in, con in concepts. It's just kind of informing everything else. So at your heart, your heart chakra is your mind in the shape of an egg, its point upwards. Okay, you're just visualizing that image. And inside of it on a little moon disc is the orange letter D. So it's implying that you already have Manjushri-ness. It's just needing to be awakened and developed. You already have this potentiality. So from this D, infinite amounts of light radiate everywhere. And first it fills your body, purifying all negativities, removing all obscurations, accumulated since beginningless time. And of course you will have doubt that that is the case, <laughs> yes? But this is a mental attitude to adopt during this section. So you just adopt the mental attitude that all of your negative karma without exception is being completely purified and try not to entertain doubts about that. Just adopt that attitude. And then you're so full that the light rays leave through your pores and the light becomes offerings to the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas delighting them. It delights them because the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas want you to practice that the best offering to the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas is practice. Mm -hmm. So they're delighted by your practice. And because of being delighted by, their, by your practice, blessings of body, speech, and mind of these holy beings dissolve into light that destroys the darkness of ignorance of all sentient beings, placing them in wisdom's illumination. Okay. So what you've got going is D, right? D and light, D and light, just simple. And filling you, sending out, Buddhas are happy. And then it's like they take up the mission of light and the light is going farther and farther and farther. So it's kind of like you're saying, wisdom is important, right? And the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas say, right. And then beaming it everywhere. Yeah. And, you know, and this is my way of explaining it, right? But this is true also. And just kind of hear it in your own words of Buddhas and Bodhisattvas are already working for the welfare of sentient beings. They already are. But the degree to which we can feel and experience that benefit is completely related to our level of karmic obscurations being purified or not, and our receptivity and our openness. So all of these visualizations increase our openness. And what prayer on its own does, not the visualization, just pivoting to prayer, is prayer links the good karma you've done with the result it can bring. So you have tons of good karma, don't you? You have tons of good karma from beginningless time, but it's not always activating as everyday happiness. And you wanna water those seeds. The best way to water those seeds is positive states of mind and prayer. Prayer is what waters those past seeds that you've created into the result that you want, which is happiness and realizations and depth in your practice. So visualization is like inviting connection with the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. Prayer is like waking up all the positive seeds you've created. And this whole thing, of course, is creating more positive karma as well. So there's a lot going on, but you don't have to be thinking of all of that, but know that in the background because it gives you enthusiasm for doing it. Because otherwise you don't know what the point of all of this is. And what I'm telling you is only the surface level. There's even more layers to go, but we'll just leave it at that. That enough is quite big. Yeah, so just gently, gently. Okay, so all the sentient beings are placed in wisdom's illumination. And this is also a reference to the great enlightenment of all sentient beings, which is what will happen at some point once everyone is a Buddha.
So you're again taking this result as the path. Your resultant Buddhahood, their resultant Buddhahood, by picturing this future kind of paradise with para, you know, with kind of utopian features and perfected beings, you bring it closer to the present. Okay, then the light rays recollect. So all the light had gone out. Now it's coming all back in into the D. It transforms into light. The little D is no longer a D, it's just light. And your ordinary perception and clinging to ordinary perception vanish. And this is a key feature of Tantra, which is to overcome ordinary appearance and grasping. Ordinary appearance of yourself is a suffering, afflicted, sentient being. You're grasping onto an inherently existent I. All of that you're purifying by identifying as Manjushri, if you have the empowerment. <laughs> okay, so if you don't have the empowerment, then you think your ordinary perception and clinging is vanishing and you kind of leave aside identity and just visualize on Manjushri at your crown and just think Manjushri exists. The embodiment of wisdom exists. And eventually you just develop a sense of strong aspiration. This is who I will be. This is who I will be. Okay. So then it goes into the details of the image. So you could just say, I emerge as Manjushri or Manjushri emerges at my crown, full stop. The rest of it is just helping you remember all of the details. And the details have significance. The image came from the enlightened mind, but the details also are like a mind map of teachings. Yeah, so they're kind of placing the teachings you've already received into some sort of visual framework that by bringing it to your mind's eye, you're reinforcing. So all of your teachings on the three principal aspects of the path, for example, embodied and represented by that lotus, sun, and full moon that he sits on. And by clarifying details, you're doing the other magic trick of Tantra, which is to develop calm abiding and special insight simultaneously. On the Sutra path, you're developing calm abiding as one project, special insight as another project, right? You do a bit of single pointed meditation. You do a bit of analytical meditation. Sometimes in one session, you take turns with them, right? But they're two different skills. They're two different tools, single pointedness and analysis. In Tantra, you're trying to fuse them from the very beginning. Even though we're gonna be kind of like mixed in our success rate. We're trying to bring them together from the very beginning. Yeah, and that's one of the ways that Tantra is quicker and more powerful, but also one of the ways that it's harder. Yeah. Okay. So you're visualizing, visualizing, clarifying details. And when you get to bearing an entrancing and serene smile. I sit amongst a mass of light rays radiating from my body, your body as Manjushri or the Manjushri body at your crown. Stay there for a second. Just stay there with that image for a second. And then once it feels as clear as it's gonna be, then you add Om Ah Hum. Yeah, you add Om Ah Hum after it's stabilized. So Om Ahum um, it represent enlightened body, enlightened speech, enlightened mind. Um, and they, you know, the little Om is sitting like upright, like standing. And little Ah standing, little Hum standing. So when we say the crown, we mean here. When we say the throat, we mean in the center of the throat. And when we say the heart, we mean the heart chakra, the heart center, not like your physical heart. Yeah, and all deities will have this section. So this isn't something that you'll have to relearn for every deity, all of them will have this. And it's to indicate and invite the qualities of the enlightened body, speech and mind. Yeah, it indicates and invites those. So by placing them there, you're inviting those qualities to you. Yeah. And the next section then is from the little whom that's hanging out there representing enlightened mind, light goes out again. 
And this time when the light goes out, it's inviting all of the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas to absorb into the Buddha that you've visualized. So you visualize yourself as Manjushri or you visualize Manjushri there. Part of you thinks it's just pretend. That's just an image I made up in my head. Yeah, it's not really Manjushri. Yeah, it's just a picture. But when you send out light and you invite the actual Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, you think they all take on the aspect of being Manjushris themselves. So all of your teachers become Manjushris. All of the other Buddhas take on the aspect of Manjushri because of, of course, all Buddhas are equal in ability and all Buddhas contain all Buddhas. They just take on these aspects for our sake and for directing particular practice, right? So all of the Buddhas, you just imagine the whole space is filled with like millions of Manjushris. And again, if it's too overwhelming, orange. <laughs> Okay, and that it all comes and absorbs into what you visualized, and that means what you visualized is now true. Yeah, so what you've pretended, what you've imagined is real. And that's what this za hum bam ho mantra means is basically come here, come close, join with me, I'm happy about it. Yes, come here, everybody in. Yeah. And um, that Zahum Bamho mantra, that um, you can think that that's happening to the Buddha above or to you yourself. But once you have the empowerment, this is another mantra that bears investigation. And if you're really curious about Tantra mantras that come up in pretty much every sadhana, I would really recommend you look at Geshe Teshi Sering's book, Tantra, from the Foundation of Buddhist Thought series. Um, and so maybe, Teresa, you can put that in the chat. Um, so the Geshe Tashi Sering series is really excellent, but that Tantra um, book has a lot of these little miscellaneous mantras that pop up everywhere and really good elaboration on them. Um, also the Burzen Archive. Yeah, the Burzen Archive, which is now under Study Buddhism Online, has a lot of free resources about these mantras. And I think often if you just pop it into the search, you'll get good teachings there. So we'll go into some of them, but if I don't get to all of them, know those two resources exist. Okay, so they absorb into me and we become one. And then you make offerings and praise. And this is easy. Yeah, there are hard mouthfuls to get your mouth around, but what's happening is beautiful goddesses are offering these things, water, water, flowers, incense, lamps, perfume, food, and music. And does anyone remember why these particular offerings are offered or what they represent? Why water, why flowers, why this order? What's the deal with offerings? Do you remember? Yeah, go ahead. It's what you would do if you were welcoming somebody into your home in the order that she would. Yep, yep. Offer. And do you remember what they represent in terms of like qualities or? practices okay. but yeah you're quite right it's like what you'd offer a vip in ancient india if they came to your house yeah um, you would give them water to drink and you'd wash their feet and you'd give them flower garlands and food and beautiful it would be just a beautiful extravaganza for the senses now the buddhas don't care yeah but for you if you think someone important is coming to your house you clean it don't you so if you clean your house and make beautiful things, you're ready for something important and sacred to happen. And even, you know, in the sutra tradition, one of the preliminary practices is to clean your room, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Clean your room and put out nice ethically obtained offerings. Mm -hmm. So it's not different, it's just deeper. And all of the depths of offerings I can't get into because we're a mixed group, but it's, so don't think it's unrelated. It's just a deeper version of the same idea. So the first reason for offerings is accumulating merit. Yeah, creating the cause for resources in the future. Then we have, um, these are sense objects, aren't they? They're objects of the eyes, the ears, the nose, the tongue, the tactile sensation. And these are the troublemakers in our life. Whenever we wanna do Dharma and get distracted, it's because one of our senses says that its needs are more important, whether that's true or not. 
It's like, I would practice, but I'm hungry. I would practice, but I want to watch something. I would practice, but I need more music. I would practice, but, but, but. So if you're offering things of the senses, you're helping to counteract that attachment to sense objects. Yeah. And the lovely psychology there, which I like, is that, you know, you offer them, but then you also are enjoying them. So it's not like you suddenly are deprived. Yeah, it's like now there's more beauty in your house. You're benefiting too, it makes your mind uplifted. But you're offering what you value to what you value. Yeah, you value Buddhahood. You value the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas and Gurus. And so by offering the things that you find sweet and wonderful, it's showing that you really respect and want connection with these representations more like what they represent yes so it's it's an interesting thing to do um sometimes you feel like it's chore to do offerings and if you feel like it's a chore take a step back and maybe do less or maybe do more depending on your personality but like sit with why it feels that way and come back to some of the psychology behind it and if you really don't want to do any physical offerings you can always do them mentally or if you're traveling, you can do them mentally. Um, I had a friend who at little at all little retreats, she would bring this very tiny set of water bowls and this very tiny picture of the Buddha and her, it was so cute. And she would just put it on the window ledge and just like had a tiny teapot. She would pour the water bowls, so cute. Um, but you can also just visualize. Or you can find a beautiful apple that's in your you know, shopping, find the best one in your shopping, wash it off and put it on the altar. That's a nice offering, yeah? And then when it's, once you've offered it, take it off, eat it, enjoy, it's fine. Yeah, so, okay, so these offerings represent qualities because again, the Buddhas want us to practice. So what we're really saying is water for washing represents purification. They want us to purify so we stop suffering. Yeah, water for washing is about purification. And then water for drinking is about taking on realizations, taking on teachings, changing the mind. And blessings really are just the mind undergoing positive transformation. Yeah. And so those two waters, and then flowers are for the open heart of compassion. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, that's one of our heart practices that we never give up. Yeah. So water for, for drinking and washing flowers, then incense is for ethics. And you'll see often in the texts, in various poetries and auspicious verses, may I have the sweet scent of morality, the sweet scent of morality. And um, have you ever been near the llamas? They do smell nice and it's not perfume. Yeah, I mean, sometimes they have some sort of liniment on or something because they're old, but you know, like they smell nice. There's some sort of like weird, like, I don't know, gardenias, I want to say something, but like when, and I remember a friend of mine saying in New Zealand when her llama died and they all came to visit her llama's body because he was still in the clear light and his body hadn't um, begun to decompose because the consciousness was still there. She said the room smelled like gardenias, but there were no flowers there. It was just a dead body, but he still looked fresh and the room smelled beautiful. And you knew that the consciousness left once the body starts to decompose. But he was there in that state for like a couple of weeks. It was fantastic. And just, you know, New Zealand, I want to say maybe 15 years ago. I think there's even a YouTube thing. It was on the news. But, you know, this happens in India all the time. And it's like India, it's hot. Yeah. And still the body, if the mind is still in tuktam, still in the clear light, the body doesn't decompose for days even in the heat. So it's interesting, but this sweet scent of morality, this is something that we offer thinking, may we practice ethics purely. Mm. Yeah. And a side effect is that we will smell nice, but that's not why we do it. It's a side effect. Just like a side effect of patience is that we'll be beautiful, but that's not the reason to practice patience. You know, it's a nice side effect. <laughs> yes. Okay. So um, incense light. So light dispels the darkness of ignorance. That's easy to remember. Yeah, light to dispel the darkness of ignorance. Um, incense light perfume. Perfume is offered at the heart. So you think that you're offering at the heart of um, the guru deity here at the heart center because that's where the mind abides. 
And of course the mind pervades the whole body and sometimes further out as well, but it's kind of like resting spot is the heart center. Mm -hmm. And so you're offering perfume to the heart to encourage yourself to have faith in your heart. Yeah. So faith in the Dharma in the sense of conviction based in experience and reasoning, not blind faith but you want faith because it leads to inspiration and aspiration and all this progress. You know, if you don't have faith, it's hard to have any energy for anything. So perfume is for faith. And perfume, agyam pajam pupe dupe, okay, gande, new day is food. <laughs> okay, food is for the food of samadhi or the food of concentration. And music is for harmonious communities. So that's lovely. Yeah, that's lovely. And so you're just kind of touching base with the fact that you already love those practices, you already want to be doing them. Just briefly, you know, you're reconnecting with a whole bunch of things that you care about in terms of your core values. Yeah, so what are you offering? You're offering your practice. And you think it takes the aspect of these pretty things but they're empty by nature. They're just in the aspect of these offerings and they give rise to uncontaminated bliss in the minds of the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas because the best offering is your practice. Um, offering questions. I mean, they're also related to the seven limbs and you know, layers, 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 but that's you know the short and sweet one. Yeah, go ahead, Teresa. Just got confused when thinking music harmonious community but then i'm also offering something that brings up attachment for me music i just got confused it's okay um all of them are supposed to bring up attachment that's why they're good objects of offering yep so that's the levels right like on one level these are things you want like we want water we want a beautiful bath you know like who's attached to the shower i'm attached to a long shower you know i have to say no short 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 you don't even have any hair to wash come on get out but you know so i have attachment to showers i don't know about you you know we and we need to drink we love flowers we love beautiful things for the eyes for the nose for everything these are all attachment objects and that's why they're good offerings so that's the like first surface layer, layer is to try to overcome attachment. Mm -hmm. In Tantra, we're trying to um, generate the bliss of attachment and then transform that. And so it's a deeper level. Yeah. yeah. So you, if you had a lot of space and time, if you were really into it, you would think of like the best time you ever met a flower. Okay, the best ever flower, want the smell of it, and you were just like intoxicated, the smell of the flower. Mm -hmm. Or if you're not desire for food, mm -hmm. yeah, and like the anticipation of the taste of the chocolate on your tongue, and then like the first bite of bliss, mm -hmm. and you take the bliss of that attachment. And then you say, which is, this object is not giving me this bliss from its own side. It's empty of inherent existence. If it weren't empty, then every time I had it, I would feel this bliss. But sometimes I'm like, oh, chocolate's nice, but I'm not feeling like bliss. Sometimes you're like, oh yeah, flowers are nice, but meh. You know, but sometimes they really trigger this like whoosh of bliss and you're just like absorbed in them, right? And sometimes whatever, yeah. Sometimes you see fireworks and you're like, oh, fireworks are beautiful, oh. And sometimes you see fireworks and you're like, wah, wah, I've seen fireworks. Yeah, if they were bliss making from their own side, they was, would always work in that way, right? But you're acknowledging the fact that these are common conditions for attachment. And you're letting your mind generate that attachment mind that really craves and wants and has bliss in relation to them remembering that that's empty of inherent existence and letting that kill the attachment while keeping the bliss. Yeah. And it takes a while to get into the swing of that, but that's a lot of what Tantra is about. Yeah. You arise the bliss of it, and then you kill the affliction while keeping the bliss or the energy, depending on what you're working with. 
So, you know, normally I wouldn't talk about these things in a mixed group, but I think there is enough out in the world that's mistaken about Tantra. It's better to kind of clarify some of these things, because I'm sure you've heard whispers and wisps of, you know, you're using attachment on the path, but that's how you're using it. Yeah. And it's, it's mental, you know, it's a mental process. So you're not actually like drinking water, taking a shower, look, you know, putting your nose in flour, you know, <laughs> like eating all the chocolate. Um, you're thinking about what that hap what happens when you're really in that state mm -hmm. and then offering that up. Yeah. And um, you're offering it in this case to Manjushri, but to yourself as Manjushri, right? So you're offering and then it comes back to you, offering and then it comes back to you. Whereas in the sutra tradition, you're just offering, which is good for generosity, good for resources, good for overcoming attachment, good for many things. In this case, now we're adding to that transformation and um, the sense of receiving because you're now the deity yourself. So these are the mantra garlands. So it's basically, oh my offer to Manju Shri, water for the feet. Oh my offer to Manju Shri, flowers. You know, so these um, central ones, argam, padyam, pupae, tupe, aloke, gande, nuade, and shapta. And the rest is repeated. And, you know, when you're doing this by yourself, you could always just think, I offer water. I offer water, I offer flowers. So if it's hard for you to get your mouth around these Sanskrit, don't worry about it. And then we do a praise because we become receptive to what we respect. And then we do the mantra recitation. And during the mantra recitation, you can kind of relax the rest of the visualization. So, up until this point, you were really thinking of yourself as Manjushri with all the features sitting on all the things. You don't necessarily let go of that completely. You just decentralize it and don't worry about whether it's clear or not. Now you just start to think of this mantra flat and then the, um, the letters upright at your heart or up here at the heart of the Manjushri at your crown. Yeah. So you're just very simple. And again, if it's if the syllables themselves, even if in English are too hard to get your head around, just orange light in a circle on a moon disk. Yeah, just orange. And again, filling you up, radiating out, coming back. Filling you up, radiating out, coming back. Gentle, back and forth. And what that means and what that does can be elaborated over time, but while you're in it, just keep it really gentle and simple until you're ready for elaboration. And when you get that mantra um, visualization going, which is like a heartbeat or like a breath, light going out, light coming in, light going out, light coming in, then you add the mantra to that, Om Arapat Sanati, Om Arapat Sanati, Om Arapat Sanati. And you get it to a speed where there is mental effort to keep it going, but you're not stressed. So it's like, it's quick enough to keep you perky, but slow enough to keep you relaxed. Yeah, and so it might be in the beginning, you're quite slow because you're just getting used to it. But then after a while, it might be like, Omar Rapsanadi, Omar Rapsanadi, Omar Rapsanadi, just because you're used to it. So when you hear people go fast, don't feel like you need to go that fast. Just go at a speed that feels like you're hitting that zone. Yeah, Teresa, go ahead. I have a mantra question. When I've learned this mantra before, then there's this d d d d d d d d d d d d d d d at the end, and maybe you can answer why people teach it that way. Yes, Teresa is preempting my next lesson, but she's quite right. There is this tradition. Oh, I know. Um, which is at the end of the mantra recitation, you do dee 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 the seed syllable 108 times in one breath. Okay, so what's that about? Um, here's the visualization. As you say D, duplicate D emanates from the D on your tongue, dissolves into the D at your heart, and after you recite all the Ds, you just gently swallow, and you imagine that the D that you're visualizing on your tongue during this part comes down and absorbs into the D at your heart disc, which becomes brilliant. 
Immeasurable orange light rays radiate from the D, filling your whole body, purifying negative karma, sickness, and hindrances. And then you think, I have received the special quality of memory, which does not forget the words and meanings of the teachings and of knowledge of all things past, present, and future. Okay, so this is the special memory um, one. This DDDDDDDD part is related to generating the city of non forgetfulness, mm. the city of non forgetfulness or the power of memory. So that's something that you do once you've finished your mantra recitation time. So, however long you want to do your mantra, whether it's one mala or 21 or whatever you want to do, seven malas only, really it's up to you unless you have a commitment from your teacher. Whenever you finish, what you do is you go Omarapatsana D, then take a deep breath. And then it helps if you um, count several per bead because you can't quite go fast enough, otherwise you run out of breath. You can't quite go that fast. So if you think like four per bead, try and do 108. If you can't, don't worry about it. But you think, okay, Omarapatsana D, a D appears on your tongue pointing towards the back of your mouth. And you go dee 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 imagining it's empowering this D at your heart. And then when you finish, you swallow and you swallow the D down to the D at your heart and think that you've received the CD or the um, realization or the power of non-forgetfulness. And even if it's something that doesn't really make sense to you, it really can work. Like if you really have to remember something, something very important, study stuff, for example, or work stuff or planning stuff, if you're doing this, it really helps you remember things. Um, it also, I think um, it has a great benefit in terms of creating the cause for a good memory in the future. You know how even some people who are regular non-Buddhists might have photographic memory? Mm -hmm. As we progress on the path, that's one of the cities or one of the realizations that we'll have is that photographic memory that remembers everything we see and everything we learn and everything that we've been through, remembers all of our past lives. So sometimes people have done really good work, but ne not necessarily with bodhicitta motivation, but they've done really good concentration work. And then in the next life, they have this random ability to have a photographic memory or they have you know mild clairvoyance. And these are all kind of like, whispers or imprints of work they've done in past lives but they haven't then picked it up and developed it and you know integrated it with bodhicitta yet mm -hmm. so then it's just kind of a cool party trick but what's the point but if but it would be great if we had those abilities wouldn't it so if we want you know photographic memory if we want clairvoyance in order to benefit all sentient beings we need really good concentration and Manjushri um, brings wisdom to that concentration and deepens it. So this practice, um, you'll see the monks and nuns do it at monasteries for regular daily class. We used to do it every day. We do our little praise to Manjushri and then we do Omarapatsanadi 21 times. And then we would go dee 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 dee. And if someone new from the public came to visit class and they saw us doing that, they were like, what? are they on about what and we're finishing all at different times and it's like just what <laughs> but um we do it and it works and it helps so we do it before we do class um often at the nunnery in the monasteries so omarapatsana d that's the story of the omarapatsana and gulp and team yep yes did that answer your question good Good. So we will do that one of the sessions um, so that you see how it goes in the sadhana. Um, and then another of the se sessions, we're going to go into these seven wisdoms a bit more deeply. And so we'll just look at them very briefly and then we'll um, stop for lunch. Okay. So here's your purifier. And this, I think you guys are used to, it's just the Vajrasattva mantra. And again, this helps you with your superstitions and your doubts. So you might think, oh, I didn't recite perfectly, or I didn't visualize perfectly, or I had some grumpy feelings. Just clear all of that, shift all of that energy that has doubt about your practice, and then move on and dedicate. But in between, if you want, here at that mantra recitation time, you can do this simple visualization, or you can elaborate to 
the practice to receive the seven types of wisdom. Mm. So we'll do that after lunch. But the seven wisdoms are great understanding, clear wisdom, quick wisdom, profound wisdom, mm. wisdom to explain the Dharma, debating wisdom, writing wisdom. So these seven wisdoms will very much help us progress along the path to enlightenment, but they will also help us very much in our daily life. Yeah, they will help us convince people of things that are important. They will help move hearts and minds towards the good. They will help us compose and write beautifully. All of these things that can really facilitate our work for sentient beings. So that is um, the sadhana in a nutshell, and then we'll do it again and uh, take a minute and dedicate. So through the power of this practice, may we quickly become Manjushri in order to lead all living beings to his enlightened state. With all of which is empty because it dependently arises. Okay. Okay, thanks everybody. So I'll see you at um, three, is it? Yeah, three o'clock Pacific or two o'clock Pacific? Sorry, now I have it's to check. Three or 3.30, it must be three. Must be three, okay. Three to six. Okay, so three o'clock Pacific and uh, have a nice lunch. <laughs>